I'm Rob Trzeszynski. This is Symposium, where we bring people together to have conversations about the nature of liberalism and a free society. My guest today is Tom Nichols, professor at the U.S. Naval College, uh, but probably best known as the author of The Death of Expertise. And we're here to talk about his new book, Our Own Worst Enemy, The Assault from Within on Modern Democracy. Thanks for coming on, Tom. Hey, Rob. Good to see you. All right. So what I like about this book, uh, Our Own Worst Enemy, is it, it kind of has an attitude that everybody's at fault. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> that we become an unvirtuous and unserious people. So talk a little bit about the, the main idea of the book. Well, I, I <clears throat> part of the reason I wrote it was that I wasn't satisfied with the explanations for why liberal democracy was in trouble, because it is. I think everybody agrees it's in trouble and not just in the United States. I think, you know, we we tend to focus a lot on what's happened to us in America over the past five years. Uh, but, you know, India, the UK, Italy, Poland, a lot of places, liberal democracy seems to be on the ropes. And it, I, I wasn't satisfied with these big systemic explanations that were, that were about, and mostly about economics. Cause I think, you know, and you and I've talked about this many times, Americans in particular, we really, we really love those economic explanations because they're quantifiable they're kind of vaguely Marxist about class, you know. They're 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 uh, they lend themselves to graphs and kind of neat solutions. But I think I, I it occurred to me over time that I couldn't make those explanations work. I mean, like every scholar, I started from the conventional wisdom. I really tried to apply those uh, notions and and come up with to get to where everybody else seemed to be about this. And I think. Um, what I came to realize, we just had to plunge our hands into something a lot messier here, which is culture and virtue and civic engagement and kind of just basically human behavior and virtue and culture. Yeah, which, I think that there's a certain element of excuse making too to the economic explanations, right? It's like it's not really my not it's not my fault. It's something I have to do different. It's just those big rich guys or or you know whoever the elites in 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 on Wall Street or in D.C. or whatever. Yeah, um, and and you know those that excuse making goes right across the spectrum. I mean, I think the, the major threat to democracy in the United States right now comes from our old comrades on the right, um, but. You know, there there is also the well. You know, why are why are kids you know pulling down statues of Abraham Lincoln? Well, it's because of you know uh, Jeff Bezos, right? It's about globalization or something, and not at all because um, you know we have a bored middle class that's looking for things to do, and so I I didn't want to take too much of a sort of you know moral hectoring point of view to say that everybody's at fault for everything, but I. I I, I just had trouble making the dealing with the excuse making in part because from a, my perspective as a scholar, as a social scientist, I couldn't make those explanations work. You, it's really hard to talk about this mass movement of the downtrodden and the oppressed when, in fact, they are real estate developers who are taking charter jets to go uh, burn the capital. Something else is going on and, and it needed a better explanation. Right. And and I like the term you used there. You called it a, lo a lumpen bourgeoisie, you know, yes. the, the taking off of lumpen proletariat and this sort of fake pessimism and inflated sense of victimhood, like, you know, as if today there, our current environment is the worst time in human history. Yeah. And I didn't make up the term lumpen bourgeoisie. I, I um, stole that from a, a debate that was ongoing among social scientists, people like C. Wright Mills in the 50s. Uh, where they were already concerned about a, a, a middle class that was uh, bored at work and restless at play. And that um, this, that at some point, material affluence and peace and um, tranquility actually create the need for drama. And the other writer that I brought into it, who I, you know, part of the joy of writing a book like this is that you rediscover some of the classics and you, you realize that they're kind of speaking to you again. And one of those was Eric Hoffer and the True Believer. And Hoffer, I mean, it's almost creepy the way Hoffer gets it right in 1951, because he's looking backward at mass movements in the 30s. And he says, the real danger is not when people are poor and oppressed and starving. The real danger is when they're bored that the real danger for a mass movement is when you have a reasonably well-off 
group of people who are bored out of their skulls because then they go looking for great crusades. And if they're, I mean, look around us today, all of the people that are, um, I, I would say, acting in some illiberal or anti-democratic way, all of them believe that they have signed on for some gigantic crusade, that they're saving democracy, they're fighting pedophiles, they're they're bringing down the capitalist superstructure. You know, that, that nobody ever just says, hey, we could do better. <laughs> you know, like we're, it's not inspiring, right? I mean, we're both laughing about this, but it's not inspiring to say, you know, um, we live in a good time and a good society, but we could do better. We could take better care of people. We need to have better policies. You, right. don't, you don't mobilize a mob by saying things are good, but we could do better. And, and, and I, I think that's the reason why. Burn them all down. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's the reason why people resist recognizing the existence of progress. Because if progress has occurred, if we live in a time where the beneficiary is a great progress, it won't justify a revolution. It won't justify you know the mob with the pitchforks. It won't justify overthrowing, tearing everything down, and overthrowing the elites. It justifies an incrementalist approach. It's like, well, you know, let's, and basically it says, let's become policy wonks and let's really get into the details and then have, you know, sober debates over whether we should do this policy or that little policy. And it, it, so it's the small ball that people are bored by. Yeah. Yeah. It's so boring. You know, the other thing, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that's a, that's an insightful comment. Um, the other problem is if I don't live in the worst times ever, and I'm not fighting some great crusade, then I'm not very special either. You know, in, in the in the absence of something else to give you right. a sense of special specialness and meaning. Yeah, right. You know, maybe I'm just and I think uh, a, a, one of the touchstones of the book is the rise over the past 40 or 50 years of narcissism, which I think is really a serious problem in the developed world. Um, but that rise of narcissism, that that increasingly narcissistic society says it's not enough for me to be a father or a sister, or a friend, or that I have a dog that I really like, or, you know, that I'm a good coworker, or that I volunteer in my community. It has to be, um, I am Thor, God of Thunder. Um, you know, I am the Dark Knight. Uh, I am the person, I am not like you sheeple. I know the truth about, you know, pedophiles or election machines or vote rigging or socialist, you know, infiltration or the Muslim Brotherhood. It's insane. I mean, it's or, literally- Or on the left, the idea that I know I'm, I'm woke to the truths of systemic oppression. That mm -hmm. means we have to totally restructure the entire society. I'm the person who understands what privilege really means and why it never applies to me, but always to <laughs> Um, and, you know, I am the, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it is, the right has become completely sodden with conspiracy theories. Uh, there are a lot of people on the left for whom the equivalent is um, the kind of sense of wonder and smugness that comes with uh, finishing that first term of a sophomore term paper in political science, where you say, my God, you know, this Marx fellow was onto something. Um, and, and, you know, it's like, yeah, but life is a little more complicated than that. Again, I don't think we should both sides. And I think we know where the major threat is coming from. But I think the unseriousness on the other side is also why we have no real antibodies to it and why we're not resisting it as well as we might as a society, because we have a completely lunatic uh, authoritarian movement on one side and a completely self-absorbed and deeply unserious movement on the other side. Well, you know, the, the thing that has really struck me is that, you know, people on the right used to complain about the victimhood mentality that people on the left had. They always see themselves as victims and they, get, they seem to get pleasure out of seeing themselves as victims. And the big thing I've seen in the last five years is that the right has gone all in on the victim mentality. I mean, Trump said at one point, you are the greatest victims. Yeah, they perfected it. It's like it's like that old PSA that used to run about drugs. I learned it from watching you. Uh, you know, it's like the people on the people on the right have taken a lot of things that the left used to do and basically adopted them and perfected them. Um, grievance is one of them. The other one is judges. Remember, remember back in the day when conservatives would say, you know, we need to win. Our ideas need to win at the ballot box. We have to convince our fellow citizens. You can't just have these things mandated by judges. No one has become a bigger fan of judges telling people what to do than conservatives. 
And that comes out of that sense of grievance that no one will ever agree with us. We're downtrodden, we're censored, we're oppressed. And so we need, you know, Amy Coney Barrett or, um, you know, um, um, Clarence Thomas or somebody to be our champion and step forward. It's, it's appalling. And it's, chi- the, the other word I wanted to make sure we got, in, it's, it's childlike, it's immature. Okay. So you, you, you put a lot of blame on social media and talk about the role of social media. And I have a great line in there. We entered the information age as adults, but we're leaving it as children. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I don't blame social media and the internet for creating the world we're in. Um, I think we started doing that in the late sixties or the early seventies with that, this level of narcissistic self-absorption. But I think that um, social media puts it on steroids if there was ever a medium and you know, we're both guilty of it. We write, we have Twitter accounts We're you know, it's, it's, it's not like that great line from the road to perdition. There are only murderers in this room and none of us will see the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> but with all that said, um, it does, it, it really is an environment that encourages activity around performative narcissistic anger especially if you have nothing else to offer. I, I will, in, our def- in my defense and in yours, we're writers. We put stuff out. We, we put ideas out there to be engaged. We answer people. We try to um, you know, present our views. And you know, I get snippy with people, and it happens. Um, but I think there are a lot of people for whom the internet is the equivalent of coming home and kicking the dog. That they just turn on the computer and say, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just screw with somebody today and I'm gonna be nasty. And that's how I'm gonna gain my psychic income, is that I'm just gonna, you know, shit post or uh, annoy somebody or be demonstratively difficult. And and um, the internet's perfect for that. It's just per- it's a perfect medium for that. Well, you know, it's it's the thing too that uh uh is the anonymity of it. It's yeah. the fact that, you know, if you were that way to people, and most of the people who are like that, by the way, in my experience, are total milk toasts in real life. They, they don't have any courage at all to the people who actually have to meet face to face. But it's really easy to go on. It's like, you know, I'm anonymous. The people I'm talking to are a thousand miles away. I can call them whatever I like and they can't do anything about it. And the more upset they get at me, the more, you know, more important I feel. So there are, I mean, and, and, you know, there's this debate, should you ever block anybody on Twitter? You know, is it cowardly to block people on Twitter? Of course you have to block people on Twitter because there's like 20% of them out there who go online just to simply be mean to people with no consequences. You know, it's, it's that, you know, I can be mean to people and never experience any blowback. So this is their hobby. You know, it's interesting. He says, I have a good friend, excuse me, who studies the Balkans. He said, you know why there isn't an internet culture like this in the Balkans? Because it's an honor culture. And because a lot of people would start hurting each other, you know, uh, in these small towns. Um, I I think that's a really unfortunate part of it. And I'll give one, I'll try and give one bit of grace to the people who, I mean, I don't know about you. I get, I get threats and hate mail and all kinds of stuff all the time. I think part of the problem is that the immediacy of the internet doesn't give you time to cool off. There have been people I know when I've, I've written stuff where that is really not worth a death threat. I promise you, you know, whether I think a politician is a jerk or, you know, whether I called J.D. Vance an asshole, which I did, um, you know, that's not worth violence. Like violence is in, in a political environment is, you know, you would think has a higher threshold than that. And I think a lot of the people who do stuff like that, if they had 10 minutes or even an hour to kind of calm down and say, yeah, that's not really who I am. That's not the kind of thing I would do. The problem is that you can say, who wrote that? And where does he work? And you can go on the internet and this, this friend, same friend, very insightful buddy, my name, Nick Vosdev, who um, um, teaches the war college with me, Nick, Nick said, you know, in the old days when someone wanted to send you some, something, a, a, a threatening or a piece of hate mail, they had to go to the post office and get the phone book to find your address or to go to a library to find out where you were like, you know, where is the Naval War College? You know, what what is the what is the address of the Atlantic? You know, um, and by the time you got there, you'd say, you know, is this really worth a stamp to me? Is this really? 
But when you're just sitting there, you know, and you're three beers in and you're having a shitty day and you're just mad at the world and you say, I didn't like this guy said something bad about you. And I don't even know who J.D. Vance is, but I'm just pissed off and I'm going to find out where that guy works and I'm going to send him a, you know, and I think um, the quickness, the, the speed that things move at encourages people to be their worst self, because, look, all of us. I think all of us, our first instinct when we're upset about something is always a bad instinct. You just kind of lash out. Um, and social media has no filter for this. It, 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 the internet has no ability to stop you from hitting that send button on an email. And then once you've done it, and I think this is something else that we haven't thought enough about with social media. Once you've done it, and you may feel stupid about it an hour later, but the only way you cannot feel stupid an hour later is to double down on it and say, no, no, I was right. And in fact, I have to be, the only way to stop this feeling of embarrassment is I have to do it again. And I have to keep doubling down and again and again and again until you're just like randomly, you know, challenging 100,000 people to a fist fight. Well, and I think also part of the problem is on the other end as well, because I think we're not as good as at, at ignoring those people. I mean, I see, you see this with these sort of cancel campaigns where I think I've seen this with big corporations that there'll be, you know, a thing on the internet, you have to do this, you have to do this. And then the big corporation will, will, will cave in. And I think it, it goes back to the fact that in the old days, you know, the days when most of the big executives came up, if you had 20,000 people writing you a letter to say they hated you because of some policy you had as a corporation, that would mean there was a massive groundswell of opposition and you were in real trouble. Whereas if you have 20,000 people doing it on Twitter, it's just Tuesday, right? It's just another day. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's totally, it should be ignored because it will just go away. They'll find something else to bark at in 24 hours. Well, and also it's, there's, it's a question of, again, kind of, of adult behavior. Um, you know, I think there are things that should get you canceled. Um, where, you know, if you say something really awful and you embarrass your company or your institution, you know, they have every right to say, not the, not the corporate image we want to project here. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether one person objects to it or a million people object. The adult decision is, is this the kind of person that represents our company? The decision that is kind of juvenile and panicky is, well, we weren't really we didn't think this was a big deal. We only had 100 people tweeting. But now that we've got 100,000 people tweeting, I guess we have to do something about it. Well, if it's offensive, it's offensive. And it shouldn't matter how many people are tweeting about it. And then there's also somebody pointed out the, uh, especially in media organizations, you know, why not just have, why not just be, you know, the adults in the room, the older people in charge have to have a policy of just don't tweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because. You know, I've brought that up where people people have gotten mad at me. And, you know, I, as you know, I'm retiring from my, my government service. But people would say, um, you shouldn't be able to say that. And I'm like, well, I'm a professor. I, have, I work in an environment that is specifically dedicated to academic freedom. So, in fact, I can't say that. Uh, and they say, well, I can't say that where I work. And I'm like, well, I'm, it's not my fault that you didn't choose a profession. So, but in other places, like when I worked in politics, you know, and you and I know this world well, there, when I worked for a senator, I didn't have an independent existence. I wasn't writing my own op-eds and saying, I think, um, you know, that that was just part of the job, that once you work for somebody else in that environment, you just don't do that. Um, when I worked for a corporation in D.C., that, you know, I didn't write lots, I didn't try and write letters to the editor at the Washington Post. Um, and I think it's really part of that entitled, narcissistic, illiberal approach that says, I have a right to say anything I want, and you have to listen, and you can't judge me for it, and you can't tell me I'm wrong. I mean, it's again, it's like, it's like dealing with small children. You don't, the First Amendment, how many times have you and I had this argument with so many people? The First Amendment means the U.S. government cannot shut you down you know, except under remarkable, extraordinary circumstances, right? You have the right to speak your mind without the government. Shut. You don't have the right to have Twitter give you a platform. You don't have the right to be on Facebook. You don't have the right to have people not give you the stink eye if you stand in public and say stupid things. Children think of freedom that way. Adults understand that that's not how it works. And on the other side, though, there's also the fact that there are people who, when they take offense, when somebody says something they don't like and they take offense to it, 
they can't just say that's offensive. I don't like that. They have to then, you know, mount a campaign. And, you know, it, it, like the other child, childhood mantra they need is, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, interesting too, that the, how the right and the left have switched sides on this, <laughs> that, you know, the left used to be the free speech movement, right? The left was let a hundred flowers bloom. The left was, you know, contrarians and dissenters are the, you know, the, the very uh, lifeblood of the nation. Now the left are the new Puritans who are saying the government must, pun the government that we've already agreed can't punish you because of the first amendment. They're now saying the government should punish you. The government, the government should protect freedom of speech, except not you. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, the right, who used to make fun of all this snowflakery and the, the, you know, the people who, you know, feelings, fuck your feelings, you know, the people on the right are going, um, I'm deeply offended. I'm wounded. I, now I'm the, you know, you have caused me deep harm by, by judging my political views. It's, it is, this is why in the book, just this is actually in the book where I talk about the horseshoe coming together, right? At the far right, and the far illiberal right and the far illiberal left have in some ways become indistinguishable from each other in terms of their behavior. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing is we used to think in that motto, facts don't care about your feelings. We used to think the operative word was facts, but we found out the operative word is your, you know, yes. facts don't care about your feelings. They care about deeply about mine. They don't care about your feelings. And um, my feelings are facts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But and that, and that actually argument actually does pop up with like, you know, how do you how dare you insult 74 million people who voted for Donald Trump? Basically, you know, if 74 million people feel something, then therefore it must be true. But, but there's something that comes up mentioned sort of in passing in the book, but I, I it, it really struck a chord with me, which is you mentioned Archie Bunker. Now, the kids aren't necessarily going to get this, but there's sort of a, a, a lot of stuff. You know, it's, it's a television show that's on in the early 70s. And you can find it out there online. And a lot of stuff that is happening today is really kind of explained by Archie Bunker. And the compare, part of the comparison you have is there's that sort of bitter nostalgia of Archie Bunker, the guy who says, uh, you know, those were the days, everything was better when I was young. And, uh, you know, guys like me, we had it made. And that's the very backward looking nostalgia of the right that says basically everything now is terrible because it's not the world that I grew up in. But there's also the interesting, most interesting thing about Archie Bunker that I think of is that the whole show was about sort of working out those differences between him and the younger generation. It was called All in the Family because it was him and his daughter. And so Archie Bunker was, you know, he was wrong. He was mildly bigoted. He had, you know, is an insensitive guy, but he wasn't viewed as evil. And he wasn't viewed as somebody to be cast out. It was like, well, you still got to get along with him because he's in your family. And that is that second part that I think we also don't have today, which is how do you deal with people who are disagreeing with you, who have views that you consider to be wrong? How can you still deal with them in a friendly and, 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 and um, uh, or civil or productive way? Uh, you know, it's, I, I'm so glad you brought up All in the Family because there's a couple of things about All in the Family that uh, the Utes who may be listening to us, uh, you know, if you youths out there don't uh, understand this, let me just tell you, uh, you could not make all in the family today. Yeah. There would no network would, uh, maybe you could get away with it on, you know, on uh, Showtime or HBO or something, but no network would run all in the family today. Uh, the Archie was not a little bigoted, Rob. Um, you know, that was a, that was a very careful elision on your well, part. The, my memories on that are a little hazy. So uh, <laughs> it, it was, no, I was Archie, young. This is a TV show. I mean, it debuted when I, it debuted when I was 10 years old and uh, it debuted with a warning. It, it came with its own trigger warning, uh, which was pretty unusual for 1971. And Archie dropped, you know, the N word. Um, you know, he he regularly used every ethnic slur there, and there nobody escaped. Mix Polacks, Hebes. I mean, it was just like this torrent of racial invective because Archie was an old. He, Carol O'Connor was only 47. That always blows my mind because he always yeah, looks older. Yeah. Um, he was a 50-ish patriarch, Protestant, cigar chomping, you know, Queens factory worker. And he his nostalgia was for the 1930s, which is insane. That was he says, they even sing a song at the beginning where he says, 
Mr. We could use a man like Herbert Hoover again. Now, I got to say, though, I've always found that I always found that to be a bit of a dodge on Norman Lear's part, because I've known some guys who are just like Archie Bunker and they were dyed in the wool FDR guys. They thought FDR was God. So I think, you know, real Archie Bunker would have been FBR Democrat. My dad, my dad, we used to call my dad Archie Bunker. He was Archie's age and he worshipped FDR, even though he became at the time the show, by the time the show aired, my dad, just like Archie, was a Nixon voter. Right. Um, but, you know, this notion of our old LaSalle, I point out in the book, our old LaSalle ran great. That that car had been out of production for like 20 years by the time that show went on. Your LaSalle didn't run great. Um, you know, that's just BS. The thing that was endearing about the show, as you point out, is that, first of all, Archie had a heart of gold in some ways, um, even if he was a bigot. And his son, who was very liberal and well-meaning, really was an annoying jerk. It was the son-in-law, uh, actually. Son-in-law, which excuse made me. It, which made it even more annoying, the fact yes, that he was the guy who came and grabbed my daughter as this annoying yes. jerk. And they all lived together in the same house, which, you know, an extended family. And he called his son-in-law Meathead. And he was kind of a Meathead. He was played by Rob Reiner. And, you know, he was grating and shrill and annoying. Um and, and there, you know, all in the family clearly didn't take sides as often as people thought it did, because there were a lot of episodes where Archie kind of got his point across, but there were also a lot of episodes where they were just a family. The, I, the one I remember, and then we, I suppose we should move on from all in the family, but it, it's, it was really important. Archie and Meathead get trapped in a meat locker together and they can't get out and they could die in there. And so they are, they were sitting there, to, you know, freezing to death, trying to tell each other's stories and wait for help. And that's when Mike realizes that Archie actually grew up in grinding poverty. And that his nickname in school, and I still remember this, was Shoe Booty. Do you remember this episode? No, I don't remember this one. Booty. And it's because he was so poor, he had one shoe and one boot that he wore to school because he didn't have a matching pair of shoes. And suddenly Mike realizes you know, this guy's a jerk, but he also went through hell, like, you know, like had to be mocked by the other kids for his poverty and, you know, and all that. And you, you know, I, re my, my dad and my mom both grew up in that kind of poverty. Um, and, and I thought, you know, it was a very endearing moment because it doesn't mean Archie's right. It doesn't mean he's a good guy, but suddenly there was this kind of humanness. And also to go back to your point, it revealed what complete BS Archie's nostalgia really was. And, and that my point to people listening who are, you know, going to read the book, I hope, is everyone's nostalgia is BS. That's the nature of nostalgia. It whites out. It's, you know, you sing songs about your old LaSalle. And then when you're, you know, dying and freezing, you admit that kids made fun of you because you had one shoe and one boot. Um, you know, it, yeah. it's and, we, and you we, and you update that a little more for people closer to our closer to, to our age, which is. You know, it, it's very common among conservatives this uh, these days, this idea of, well, there were the good old days when you could afford a house and, you know, a single earner could afford a house and their good old days are like 1972, which yeah. you know, I, I remember just a little bit of the 70s. And, it, and it's it, enough to know it was not the good old days. No, it was horrible. Uh, and, you know, uh, my my spirit animal on this particular issue is Kevin Williamson, who is just brutal with people who talk. He's like, yeah, you can live the way your parents did, but you better commit to that. Um, you know, and it's the same square footage and no car and one phone and one small black and white TV and no cable. I mean, you want to live like your parents did and have that? Yes, it is well within your reach, even now on a very low salary. But it is not going to be living in Brooklyn with, you know, a 50 inch television and exposed brick and, um, you know, um, hanging out, uh, having a lot of takeout dinners. And uh, they just I think, you know, we we this is part of what I think is destroying democracy. Liberal democracy cannot compete with your screwed up memories especially if you're young and these are manufactured memory. I mean, the, the nostalgia of the old is bad enough, right? Cause it's full of whiteout, you know, it's full of edits and, you know, kind of redactions. Now, there's, there's a scientifically proven tendency to, yes. to retain the good parts and lose the bad parts. 
absolutely that is absolutely right. Uh, but even worse is the nostalgia of the young for something they never experienced, meaning it is a completely constructed memory of something they never lived through. So I, I bristle when kids say to me, oh, you had it easy in the 70s. I'm like, excuse me, I was alive in the 70s. It was not a good time. I was there. Take my word for it. Yeah, and I find that particularly true for the cultural nostalgia. So one of the things we talk, you talk about in the book, and it's, I think it's a, a totally, a, a very important thing to remember, is that economic populism has basically given way to cultural populism. Yes. And that economic grievance has given way to cultural, because you know, how do you maintain economic grievance whenever, when you people have 50 inch TVs? You know, it's, and when food, I think you know, the big statistic I like is that food as a portion of an average person's income has gone from being like 40% to being 5%. So how do you maintain this narrative of, of economic grievance? So you have to come up with cultural grievance. And the cultural grievance is though really upset me because a lot of times it's like, if you have this cultural grievance, why aren't you doing something in your life to change that? So like some, one of these alt-rights or traditionalist web uh, Twitter feeds put out a thing saying, Oh, isn't it terrible? We aren't doing things like this anymore. It's it's ballroom dancing in you know the in the Victorian era. And I'm like, you can go ballroom dance. Nobody's stopping you from ballroom dancing. And somebody pointed out they have these balls still in Vienna. You know, you could go there. You could you could dance in this exact place wearing that exact outfit in Vienna if you can get an invitation. So it's this idea that you know you complain about the culture, but you don't do anything about it. Well, it, it, let's take something even more important um, and central. You know. Back in the good old days, people went to church. Okay, do you? Well, no. Well, I'm an atheist, so I'm not. I don't. You know, but some of the but Trump voters who claimed that you know one of the most interesting outcomes of the the 2016 and 2020 you know um, the kind of granular look at the vote. Trump voters described themselves as evangelical Christian, you know, religious but actually had very low rates of church attendance. Trump voting behavior actually decreased with more church attendance. So the people that were complaining the most about how, you know, we're not a traditional society anymore, people don't go to church. You mean you, <laughs> you know, like we don't go to church. No, you mean you don't go to church. And, and it's not just churches, other kinds of civic associations right. and, and volunteering and getting involved and, and it not just, you know, being on Twitter is not getting involved or, or forming associations. It's doing that, you know, actually around you. Um, I wanted to, your point about the economic nostalgia becoming um, cultural grievance, this is really important. And I think, you know, before you and I, before we started taping, um, you know, I, I said I, I, I had trouble with the book at first because people were so wedded to the economic explanation. Uh, and when you would, you know, even if you were talking four or five years ago about why are people becoming so anti-democratic, why are they so liberal? It's like, well, the Great Recession, you know, well, it's the Great Recession. Well, it's the Gulf War. Well, it's Afghanistan, you know, and it turns out to not be those things. And those those arguments died on the vine pretty quickly. Um, and I was actually the guy who said the, the one of the people I quoted in the book was um, Shadi uh, uh, Hamid from Brookings, who said, boy, you know, the minute the economy turned around, all of these populist movements just dropped the economic argument like a hot rock. And all of a sudden, instead of it being about income inequality and wealth and, you know, the, the cost of education or health care, it became about immigrants and brown people and crime and um, you know, um, Islam, and uh, all of a sudden it just became about something else because the economic argument just wasn't there. Yeah, or, or it became about woke, you know, woke scolds uh, imposing something at a university halfway across the country and not in Kansas where you are. Right? Where you are, yes. It, 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 it's about immigrant, you know, um, I'm very concerned about immigration. Where do you live? Northern New Hampshire. Yeah. Oh, you, you're not, you don't mean Canadians, do you? <laughs> Well, so, so, but this issue about, you know, why aren't people going on joining associations that brings me to, I thought one of the most interesting parts of the book was the Italian village. Mm -hmm. So this, this example of the Italian village, if you could explain that for people. So back in the 1950s, um, and this book, by the way, that I, I, I drew this from was a classic in, in social science. It was a huge book by a guy named Edward Banfield. If you went to school and studied anthropology or political science or sociology, you just read this book um, for like 40 years. It was just a standard part of an education. 
And it's by a guy named Banfield, who's not actually an academic, right? He's a he's an FDR New Dealer who um, is trying to figure out why the New Deal isn't working in some places. And, and like, you know, in Arizona and Utah and other places where farmers in particular just won't cooperate with each other. And he can't figure this out. And he kind of gets disillusioned with the New Deal. And he goes to the University of Chicago and he gets a doctorate. And while he's working on that, he goes to Italy. And he lives in a small village, and and the place is so screwed up and backward um, that he gives it a pseudonym because he doesn't want to like insult the people of this town, and he calls it Montegrano. And what he finds is that democracy. He really wasn't trying to write about democracy; he's trying to write about poverty. But he said, you know, people don't prosper, and democracy doesn't work. And democracy, which produces you know more prosperity, these people cooperate and they're capable of doing bigger things together. None of this works if people are basically just selfish, lazy villagers. And that might seem really an obvious thing to say, but you have to realize that in the 50s, after the New Deal, and then again in the 60s and the 70s, the idea that culture causes problems was totally unacceptable because there were, especially when you were talking about the inner city, a lot of the academic community called that victim blaming. And they said, no, 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 you can't call it, you can't talk about the pathology of the inner city. You know, and here was Banfield saying, I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about a village in Italy where these people just can't get along with each other. And that actually came back into vogue years later when Robert Putnam at Harvard does a whole study of Italy again and shows that if you inst because Italy had this huge government reform, they put all the same institutions into place from north to south. And amazingly, the south doesn't work very well because southern Italy is just a different culture. Um, and so now it's kind of accepted wisdom. So I thought I would reintroduce people to this book and to this village by saying, look, look at the look at everything that was written about this backward screwed up village in 1950. And think about how much, or 1954 or so, think about how much this sounds like America today. And that should scare the living hell out of you, that you can talk about this backward commune of peasants, and yet it sounds exactly like America. And the, the example that, I, that jumped out at me when I was writing the book was, um, there is great suspicion of education and success. Right. Nobody likes anybody who gets the local school teacher in this commune was like, I can't I can barely do my job because there is tremendous envy of knowledge or education or any kind of success. And everybody just assumes that anybody who's knowledgeable or successful is somehow screwing everybody else over. Yeah, you're you're one of the uh, I, I I call it the 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 a sneering chin stroking class. I got called that the other day. So I have, okay. to, I have to remember to sneer while. Well, while uh, stroking, I don't know if it's possible to sneer while stroking your chin, but I'm well, going to well, try working on it. That's why the book, you know, and you may have noticed, I mean, it's unusual and all that. I mean, this is actually my seventh book, not my second, but, um, you know, I had a career of academic writing. And part of the scholarly thing is you keep yourself out of it. But in this book, I really felt the need to be a little more autobiographical because I get the reaction you did. They said, well, Tom, you were born in a Tony Boston suburb to college professors who sent you to, you know, Andover. Like, of course, none of that is true. I grew up in a factory town with very poor parents who had, who neither of whom finished high school. Um, you know, I was on my, by the time I was 14, I was on my way to jail. Um, you know, and, and so this notion that somehow, well, you're part of this sneering education, you know, chin pulling class, um, that goes all the way back. That is, that is embedded in this commune in Italy um, that, you know, anyone, they don't hate wealth. I mean, and again, it's kind of like our modern society now, they don't really hate wealth as much as they hate anybody they think is superior to them in some way. Well, they and hate wealth when other people have it. Well, and they, the, the wealthiest members of this community that they trust actually don't live there. They live in Rome. Um, you know, and they kind of say, yes, yes, we're helping. We're, we're here in Rome. We're looking out for you. And they said, no, that's, those guys are okay. But if you actually live there, um, you forget about it. Now, now you, you talk about it as being an example of selfishness. And I want to hash out this issue of self-interest because there's obviously a another sense in which they are harming their self-interest because by, by working together and forming associations, et cetera, they would actually be better off in the long run. But it's this sort of narrow view of, 
I'm only going to focus on myself and my family, what I can chisel out of from my neighbors, rather than looking at that, that wider picture of how could we cooperate and how could we work together to, to make sure have a, have a, have a better environment for everyone that we, we can prosper. Yeah, and there's, you know, enlightened self-interest is the basis of every society. Um, that's how we manage to live together. You know, we I do what's good for me, but I also do things that are also good for you, and we cooperate. Um, the selfishness comes, I think, um, from this kind of petty resentment that governs us now. And this is, again, why I wanted, I, I, I wanted to do the, the example of the Italian village to say, look, this isn't about you. This has happened before, and this is always bad when it happens. When a society falls into this, you know, I'm just here to screw you over, and I'm going to vote. One of the things that really jumped out at me about the Italian example was there is no quicker way to lose friends in this village than to be elected to something. And instantly they hate you, and they, and they just punish you, squeeze you for everything they can get for themselves, and then vote you out of office. Um, you know, because the minute you get elected, you're, you're dirt. And I thought this is, this is so much like our, 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 the society we're living in now, um, where we, we sit, we are constantly on the lookout in this very paranoid and suspicious way. Uh, but, but there's nothing wrong with self-interest. And I say that in the book, it's okay to be self-interested. It's not okay to be destructively selfish. Yeah. So what, what, what really jumped out at me reading the Italian a village example is one of my favorite passages from Tocqueville. And mm -hmm. I've got it here. He says, well, the doctrine of self-interest properly understood is not new, but it is among the Americans of our time. It has come to be universally accepted. You hear it as much from the poor as from the rich. And he says, the Americans enjoy explaining almost every act of their lives on the principle of self-interest properly understood. It gives them pleasure to point out how an enlightened self-love continually leads them to help one another and disposes them freely to give part of their time and wealth for the good of the state. So he's basically saying that this, this doctrine of enlightened or rational self-interest is what causes people to not be the narrow constricted thing, but to be able to cooperate together and, and to, to do things for, for the, that benefit everyone. And yet in Montegrano, as Banfield points out, there's a there's an orphanage for little girls that's literally crumbling. And the town is full of unemployed stonemasons and not one of them volunteers to walk over and say, listen, I'm not busy. I'm out of work. Um, you know, hey, sister, what do you need done here? You know, because it's all run by nuns. Not one of them walks over. Nobody donates any food to the York. Nothing. It's like a, they're not my kids. So it doesn't exist. And I think that is increasingly the kind of society that, that we're becoming uh, because we don't have, and some of this is not just because we've become bad people. The nature of modern life is that we can spend a lot more time alone. We can achieve and accomplish a lot without having to cooperate with other people. I mean, I'm really struck by, uh, even as an academic, which is a kind of a lone wolf thing, that 25 years ago or 20 or 25 years ago, I had to spend a lot more time around my colleagues. There were just things that we had to talk to each other about face to face. Um, we spent a lot more time in each other's offices. We were exchanging physical materials like books. Um, I, I'm able to do a whole ton of my career now. And, and literally, I, can, I have been to department meetings where there's a new guy and I'm like, I don't know who that is, you know, um, because I just am not in the hallway because it's not necessary. And I think that's true in every endeavor. We, there are, you know, increasingly we don't have to be around each other. And so we just say, because I'm not around other people, I don't need other people, but, but, but you do, you know, the song's not wrong. People who need people, I'm not going to sing that one, but you know, <laughs> we do need each other. We need that interaction to keep us, to keep us decent. I think. Well, the other thing that that strikes me about the, especially about the internet era, is how easy it is to distract you with things that make it look as if you're doing something, that make mm -hmm. it look as if you're engaged, but which are purely symbolic and performative and don't actually inv don't actually involve a, a, a connection with another human being, don't actually involve any practical result. You know, it's, and these are the people who go to be mean to people on Twitter, and they think that. You know, being uh, th there was this uh, recent controversy about a, a reality TV contest show called The Activist, 
where these people are going to compete for who could be an, you know, and as judged by Julianne Huff, I don't get that, uh, but they're going to compete at who would be the best activist. And the big measure is social media engagement. Right. Well, is social media engagement isn't going to feed any of the any of the orphans. It's not going to fix the walls of the orphanage. It's just it's it's a purely symbolic make you feel good about yourself thing, but it's a substitute for actually accomplishing something. And it totally undermines the notion of activism, which is something that is done because it is right for its own sake. You know, not because you're getting likes and because you're on TV and it's a competition, but you know, the people that are the real heroes are the people who do this in the shadows who are never recognized, who are never applauded, who never see a clean light. Um, You know, I am shamed that one of my very best friends, a guy I, I have known for decades, he became um, a um, uh, a Catholic uh, monk, but and, you know the kind who lives in, he lives in the inner city and he kind of ministers to the poor and he does all that stuff that you don't see in a big city. He's the guy that makes sure people eat and have a place to sleep and all that stuff. And he said, um, you know, I asked him and I said because he seemed very happy and he said it really is a great gift. He said. To, to be able to give love and expect absolutely nothing in return. You know, that, that it's a very liberating feeling that you just do this, you give this freely, you give this love, you expect nothing. You expect no thanks, no love in return. You do it for its own sake. And I thought, man, I wish I were as good a person as my friend. But if you're being an activist because you're on a goddamn game show trying to get social media hits, that's the opposite of all of this. That's not civic involvement. That's yeah. that's about you. Well, and also the, the 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 my response to that is, well, why is this guy not getting love in return if he's doing all these great things? You know, what's the matter with everyone else that that they're not noticing and they're not you know but, engaged with that? I think his point was that you know there are yeah. people who are just down and and you know have hit the hit bottom, and they are you're just going to take care of them, and whether they thank you or love you back, you've done the right thing by giving this love to another human being to say I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to make sure you're fed, and you know whether you love me or hate me is not why I'm doing it, you know, and I I, th- I thought that was just such a great expression of you know this selflessness. Uh, because the psychic income comes from knowing that you've done the right thing, not from an audience applauding you. And in the book, I talk about Christopher Lash, you know, a book we're both familiar with on the culture of narcissism. And Lash warned us in 1979, he said, we are becoming increasingly a culture that is entirely performative. And I think the people who do things for their own sake, like, you know, this monk, you know, just doing things for the poor, people who do activism, you know, drinking bad coffee at two in the morning and making phone calls and doing all the stuff they have to do, that's that's the opposite of the culture we've become, which is now I only do it if there's a performative aspect to it and I get some kind of reward from it. Yeah, and I think that performativity goes into the politics. Uh, is, is, I mean, it's always been the nature of politics, right? That it's about... Um, yeah, I love the origin story of the the word bunkum. Uh, that there was a guy who represented what the supposed origin is. There was a guy who represented Buncombe County, and he gave a speech in Congress. And somebody said, "Well, why? You know, this speech does nothing. It doesn't change anything. Why did you do it?" He says, "Well, I just had to feel I had to do something for Buncom." You know, he, <laughs> he was there. You know, it was it was a good thing for him to have give to to be in the papers as, as having given a speech, even if it accomplished absolutely nothing. But you know, you you brought up the you brought up the problem of, and yet people vote against their own interest, right? That nonetheless, people. This is the what's the matter with Kansas argument, and and again, part of the reason I included Italy was to say long before there was a what's the matter with Kansas, there was a book that basically boiled down to what's the matter with this Italian village, and in the end, I think it becomes a matter of if you've decided that psychic income. And your sense of revenge or social resentment is more important than even the the slightest delay in gratification or long term thinking um, that you get this kind of behavior. Yeah. Um, so, so I always had a problem with the "what's the matter with Kansas" argument because I thought it made some very big assumptions about what would actually be good for the people of Kansas. So this, you know, guy coming from the left, they said, "Why aren't they voting for the left?" Because that would be left. Yeah. <laughs> But but the thing is that um, 
at least that's an ideological difference. And what I see, you had a line here that I liked, which is, uh, I think you're quoting Jonathan Rauch. Is we're not seeing a harden, we're not seeing a hardening of coherent ideological difference. We're seeing a hardening of incoherent ideological difference. So it's it's not just um, a failure of engagement with other people, but it's also a failure of, of sort of coherent thinking and having a coherent worldview. Yeah, I, and I agree with you about you know, I mean, Thomas Frank, as I say in the book, he's a man of the left. You know, what he thinks probably would work for Kansas is you and I would disagree with. On the other hand, he really has a point here that that these are folks that are voting for um, people who literally are grinding them into the ground and then turning around and saying, who betrayed us? You know, who who keeps putting these people into power? Ask the voters. <laughs> um, and where Roush, I think, dovetails into that is because people have become so incoherently tribal they will literally vote for the people that are going to burn down their own village if they think that it keeps them away from being allied with the sneering, chin-stroking intellectuals like you um, or me. And and I and that's the really self-destructive part. And there, there's a kind of a third, if we were going to take these as a trilogy of, you know, what's the matter with Kansas and um, Ban Banfield's book about Italy, then, then there's dying of whiteness. Um, which is Metzl's book, Jonathan Metzl's book, where he goes into these areas where people literally are saying things to him like, I need a new liver, but if Obamacare is the way I get a new liver, and that means somebody else might get one too, screw it, I'd rather die. That your own sense of resentment and self-empowerment and your own sense of identity becomes so overwhelming that you literally will die. Well, yeah, I, I had a piece that came up... I had a piece that came up this morning where I talked about how COVID has basically been a giant natural experiment to test whether people would die rather than admit they're wrong about politics. Yes. And, and I think COVID, you know, that was where I was going with it because COVID is like the guy in Tennessee. This case was in Tennessee where a guy says, I'd rather die than get a new, new liver. Um, that where people are going to say, not only would I rather die, but I will take you with me rather than climb down out of this tree. And I think it's because... And this is where we come back to social media and come back to the internet. They have become part of a kind of constructed community that they think they're a part of. You know, what will Tucker Carlson think of me if I go get vaccinated? You know, instead of saying, look, I take my cues. I live on a, you know, I live in a small town right now, um, have for 25 years. You know, what do my neighbors think of me? What do my people at my church think of me? What do the, my colleagues at my school think of me? But these people are now part of a this larger, and, and this happens as well with, with the woke left, that they're part of this large constructed community of, of people who whose leaders impose norms that have no cost for them as elites, but that have a lot of cost for the rank and file. Um, you know, that, that, that really do matter to the average person. And so when they say, well, you know, Tucker Carlson gets up there and say, well, you know, there's a lot of, yeah, I know I'm vaccinated and I work in a vaccine proof environment here at Fox news, but if you get vaccinated, I'm going to look very constipated. <laughs> I'm going to give you this, the quizzical German shepherd tilted head stink eye, you know, and, and suddenly you have people whose only form of social tribal identification is through these kinds of bizarre constructed communities. So well, I just can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't live with that level of cognitive dissonance. I will be too humiliated by it. Yeah, I, I, but you also mentioned in the Obamacare example that you mentioned, the thing that I found most interesting, and I think this really is true, is the number of people who were against Obamacare, but didn't want to repeal the Affordable Care Act and didn't yes. realize these are the same thing. And, and it's it's the it's the failure of thinking, the incoherence of thinking that, you know, it's not just you're not connecting with other people, you're also not connecting together the facts and and information and ideas that you have. That you're not forming, you're not forming coherent communities. You're also not forming a coherent, coherent worldview. You know, and you've you've seen this happen a million times, Rob. When people say, "Well, you know, you can't, you can't, um, you can't make fun of those people, and you can't judge them, you can't look down on them." I I'm sorry. If you are in favor of keeping the Affordable Care Act and repealing Obamacare at the same time, I'm going to burst out laughing, as tragic and stupid as it is, because at some point. We have to treat each other like adults. It is not, it is not an adult 
civic responsible thing not to know the difference between Obamacare and the ACA, nor is it an adult civic responsible reaction to patronize someone and say, well, it's okay that you don't know that. Yeah. Um, that, that, that one moment of stupidity and, and willful ignorance and refusing to be better informed has potentially tragic consequences for millions of people. And it now, deserves our opprobrium. Now, the question I have, though, is, you know, aside from scolding people, which is, is comes naturally to you, uh, and, and to the rest of us sneering chin strokers, uh, uh, <laughs> Aside, but I mean, I, I, I don't want to downgrade the actually the importance of, you know, giving people a good hard talking to which is some, you know, can be can be worthwhile. At least I'm, I'm I do that to my kids occasionally. So I'm hoping it works. Um, but uh, what are the solutions? Where do we go from here? How do we how do we push back against these these forces? I, I hate this part of every discussion about the book because um, I, I this is where I always feel so bleak. Um, so I. I I'll, I'll say that solutions fall into three categories. And one of them is, you know, when I started writing the book, um, one of the reviewers, because it's an academic, you know, it's Oxford Press, it's peer reviewed and all that. And so one of the peer reviewers said, well, I hope Tom doesn't just end up with a lot of uh, moral hectoring. I'm going to I'm gonna um, speak in defense of that and say, you know what, a little more moral hectoring would be good for our society. So I am going to stick with some of that and say a good hard talking to. But I also think on the personal level, we need to start modeling the behavior we'd like to see in ourselves and other fellow citizens, because that the moral hectoring, I think, especially, um, and I've tried to have this argument with our new colleagues and comrades in a coalition on the left, um, you know, just sort of screaming at people and, and mow mowing them about, um, you know, their, their insufficient revolutionary consciousness um, isn't really going to get you anywhere. Um, you have to model that kind of thing. And I, I thought of this one day, I was with my wife and here's a very small, this is a, like a microscopic example of what I'm talking about. My wife and I were on a highway in Connecticut and a guy drove by us with like fluttering, um, you know, Trump flags and, a, and an F Biden flag and, all, you know, really just like this big attention seeking. If the car could make a noise, it would have been like a big ooga horn, you know? And I and my wife was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this guy I said, you know what, the guy, this guy has done this so that everyone will give him dirty looks and cut him off. And he was signaling to get in front of me. And I slowed. I said, after you, you know, let's not do that today. Go ahead. I don't care about your stupid flags. I'm not going to, you know, play chicken with you on the highway. Go ahead. You want to take a left, take a left. Um, be the better. I know it sucks. <laughs> to say, be the more mature, be the better person. But I think we have to start modeling more of that stoic behavior. And I, my advice to people about the Cohen, uh, COVID um, epidemic is stop arguing with anti-vaxxers. Simply put up your hand and say, I'm vaccinated. I'm an adult. You have to live with your consequences. We're not having this conversation. I'm not going to talk to you about microchips and Bill Gates and, you know, Tony Fauci and all the, you know, we're not having that conversation. Uh, on, a, on a more practical level, I think we have to stop trying to fix democracy with gigantic projects that we know are not going to succeed. Um, we need to have, stop having big think. And, and I'm going to chide some of my fellow uh, writers and democracy activists, stop stop trying to rewrite the Constitution. You're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. It's going to just frustrate everybody. It's, you know, we have to get rid of the Electoral College. You know, whether we do or don't have to get rid of it, it's not going to happen. The states are not going to vote to do that. It certainly will not happen in time to get us out of this kind of dark 20-year crisis that I think we're headed into. So just, just stop it. You know, be adults. Don't, stop trying to, you know, I, I will save democracy, you know, with this one chapter in a book. Pick things that are scalable. For the ordinary person, are you registered to vote? Have you helped other people register to vote? Um, you know, are you making sure that the potholes are filled? Do you have enough bus service in your town? These are bipartisan projects that you can inform yourself about that don't require party or tribal identification. And the more we do that on a micro level, the more used to it we're going to get. Talk, go, to a ten, go to a town council meeting. Just sit there. See what happens. Um, you know, people say, oh, I don't have time for that. No, you have nothing but time. Most people have time coming out of their ears. 
uh, these days. So that's another thing to do. In the book, I do make an argument for a summer of national service. Um, I think it's an, it's not a draft. It's, you know, I, I arbitrarily set the number at like six weeks. Um, because again, I think we could have a bipartisan agreement that six weeks of like kind of mini ROTC training or mini drill training um, demystifies guns. It teaches kids that they have to live with other people they don't like teaches them that they have to get up in the morning, even whether they want to or not. I, I, I'm so tired of national service debates revolving around paying kids to pick up litter. I think those are stupid and they, and they haven't worked. And I just don't think that that creates a sense. Kids, kids need a sense of shared experience about something, even if it's just for six weeks or so for with people that are not from their neighborhood. Um, and finally, I would really like to see activists sane activists strengthen party organizations because the parties have just become flags of convenience for kooks. Um, and, and that's on the, both the right and the left. I'm sorry, the Democratic, you know, the Republican Party has really been captured by people who say, I'm Marjorie Taylor Greene. I think, I believe in Jewish space lasers. Therefore, I'm a Republican. Um, a Republican Party worthy of the, the name would say, you are not a member of this party. That is not actually what we stand for. But I'm going to chide the Democrats and use the example I love to use so often. If you're Bernie Sanders and you want to become the Democratic nominee for president, here's an idea. Join the Democratic Party. <laughs> Takes you 10 minutes. Probably fill out. You could have a staffer do it for you. Fill out a form. Um, the idea that you could, and I, you, you know, I was no fan of Hillary Clinton, but I voted for her. I argued for voting for her. I, I was pissed on Hillary Clinton's behalf that she had to fight for the nomination against a guy who wouldn't even join the party. That just seems wrong to me. Yeah, and, so, and we used we used to complain in the old days about the smoke filled rooms, the back rooms where th things were really decided, and that you know the people didn't have enough back. choice. But there, there was a virtue to them, and that was that it, it provided some or organizational, institutional stability. And you had wiser heads who would say, you know what, this person can't be the face of our party because he's a kook. Right. Or um, and also this person can't win. Um, you know, this, this person may have charmed, uh, you know, a, a, a segment of our party and caught fire for a little bit. But as you say, this is not the person to represent us. This is not the person who can win. Um, you know what? I'm a cigar smoker. Bring back the smoke filled rooms. I, I will come, you know, any party that wants to have me in that room, uh, I'll bring the Havanas. Um, but, I, but I think that, you know, democracy is a good thing, but parties are not public utilities. They are private organizations that should be run by people who care about what they believe in. They're, they're not flags of convenience. Now, now one last, what I want to end with, though, is that uh, there's a, it's easy to be pessimistic about the current state of things. But one of the things you mentioned in passing is that, you know, people imagine liberal democracy has failed and has all these problems, but it doesn't have one tenth as many problems as the authoritarian regimes of the world tend to have to face to deal with. Yeah, I mean, to me, the, the ground state, the kind of static state of a human being is uh, freedom. Uh, I mean, you know, the, uh, Bush 43 tried to make this argument when he was making the argument for his democracy agenda. And I think he made it poorly. And I think he the way he kind of bumbled around with doing this was to say American democracy. I just think in the end, and I think, you know, Reagan said the same thing at the end of the Cold War. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, boy, I hope somebody tells me whether I can go to church or who I can marry and whether I can leave the house and what job I have to have. You know, people are not born with an innate sense of tell me what to do. Um, you know, they, they you, you know, you get up in the morning, you want to eat ice cream, you eat ice cream. You want to take a walk, you take a walk. We're born with agency. Um and so I think that the default state of a human being is to be free. And, and that's part of the argument that we're having now in the 21st century. What do human beings really want? You, you know that there's a bunch of our former comrades on the right who have become basically theocrats, who not, you know, people who say things like, um, we, will, uh, we will institute a sovereign who will tell us what to do and we will thank him for it. 
right? We will be grateful to be told what to do. And it, that's a real quote, by the way. You're not making that up. Yes, I'm not making that up. That is a that is Adrian Vermeule. He's a Harvard Law School professor. He literally talks about curtailing your freedom by having a powerful authoritarian sovereign who who that we will later we will literally thank him for and, limiting our freedoms. And he refers to us as subjects, by the way, which yes, I thought was subjects, the most provocative citizens, part. But subjects, um, and that shows you how crazy the American right has really become. That this is just like, you know, feverishly nuts. This would be like the democratic socialists, you know, who have have their meetings and call each other comrade. It would be as if they took over the entire Democratic Party, you know, which they most assuredly have not. Um, but but I, I think that we need to plant that stake in the ground again to say, no, we are not just a bunch of people looking to be led. We are not a bunch of people looking to have some, you know, American Pope appointed over us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we are not people who are looking for a, a great white father um, who is going to, you know, lead us to, to clear rivers and uh, tell us um, where we can sleep and who we can marry and, and what we can eat. And I, and I think that that in the book, my argument is political entrepreneurs of the extremes are trying to convince us of that because that is their only road to power in, an illiberal, in, a, in a liberal democracy is to convince us to junk the whole system and to put them in charge. And the minute we start even flirting with that idea, we are lost. Now, I, I, to end on a more optimistic note, I think the good news is we have the history, we have the institutions, we have the ideas of a liberal society deeply ingrained in America. So we have a lot to work with, but we need to understand, you know, we have to have the, uh, uh, I think, you know, where I, I'd say I end on an optimistic note, but at the same time, I think we have to be alarmed enough <laughs> to say, okay, we have this, but we have to restore it. We have to defend it. We have to actively support it. And uh, and and figure out how to get it back to uh, or how to get it working properly. I don't want to say back because there's always been problems, but how to get it working properly. Well, one place that I think is a source of optimism, and and it's another one of these weird places where the right and the left have traded places. Um, one source of optimism in, in the United States is federalism which liberals have suddenly rediscovered with great vigor. You know, it used to be federal, liberals were like, hey, the federal government, you know, should be the most powerful and just tell us what to do. And all of a sudden, you know, you have people saying, uh, you know, Donald Trump can say what he wants. We're not doing that here in Arizona. You know, um, we're not doing that in California. We're not doing that in, in you know, Michigan. We're, we're actually capable of governing ourselves. And I think that's been a wonderful, insofar as there has been a good part of all this, it's been a wonderful thing to see people in places like, you know, um, wherever, Michigan, Massachusetts, uh, Ohio, say, you know, um, it's, it, I, I may not like the way the country's going, but I don't want people coming out here and telling me what to do. Um, you know, telling me how to run Michigan or telling me how to run Indiana or, or South Dakota or California. And that, I think, this is the one place where all of the analogies to the 1930s and the fascism and communism, all that fails. The United States is this big, fractious, federal, hot mess that's simply impossible to capture um, because we're just so, you know, because you're, you're not trying to capture a government. You're trying to capture a government plus 50 other governments uh, spread out all over the place. You know, Hawaii might end up being free America at some point, but it's still going to be there. So I think that that's a, I think that's kind of an optimistic way to look at it is that in the end, people, we don't live in Washington. We don't live in Donald Trump's backyard. We don't live on a college, you know, super woke college campus. Most people say, listen, I'm, I'm pretty capable of running, you know, m- this town and this state. And, you know, thanks for your advice about how I need a king. Uh, you know, or a revolutionary committee. I think we've got this. Thank you. I really appreciate your sharing perspective about your book, uh, the, Our Own Worst Enemy, like the, sub, uh, the, the subtitle, The Assault from Within Modern Democracy. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Rob. I'm Rob Trusinski with Symposium Magazine. My guest today has been Tom Nichols, author of Our Own Worst Enemy. You can subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast. And above all, you can find more ideas about liberalism and a free society at symposium.substack.com. Thank you for joining the conversation.